want to focus on part two of worshiping God again. Write this down, please, and I will review the source of idolatry. Please write that down. And I want you to listen carefully to what we're going to talk about tonight because you're going to see why much of our, what we call worship, does not attract God. First of all, we want to note the importance of separating the means from the end. And that was our foundation last night. And this statement is important to write down. When more worth is placed on the means than the end, then the means become an idol. It's like worshiping the hose instead of the, the water that's coming through it. The means for most of us has become our end. And when I say us, I refer to myself. Number two, any other worship than God is idolatry. Any other worship than God is idolatry. Do you know what was Saul's failure? He worshipped worship. And then he told God how important worship was to him. And he actually told God that worship was more important to him than God. He told God that. Could you imagine telling God, I disobeyed you so I could use my disobedience to worship you. That's what Saul told God. You told me to kill all the animals, but I kept some, disobeyed you so I could worship you with it. God says, are you crazy? You mean, you think that the sacrifice is more important than the God you're sacrificing to? And he never survived his throne. He lost his kingdom. God is not interested in your song if it's not to him. <laughs> we sing to audiences not to God it's I told you last night it's a very difficult thing to do do you know how difficult it is to dance before the Lord with people watching that's tough because you become people conscious so you start wondering how my dress look. Uh, when I lift my leg, I wonder how the thing flows. Uh, did I turn right just now? Am I keeping the beat? In other words, you got all this going on and you're trying to focus on God and all these people watch it. How do you sing to God when everybody's watching? And suddenly the song becomes more important than the God you're singing. And the people who are listening to the song become more important than the God you're singing. And so the song and the people have become the idol. Because when the means become more important than the end, you have an idol. And your first memory is, I wonder if that was a good song. I wonder if I did well. I wonder what people think. I mean, when you finish the song, it's not how what God thinks. It's not... I wonder how God received me tonight. It was, I wonder how they received me tonight. It's a tough thing. It happens even when you're teaching the word of God as a preacher. Many times I have to keep begging God, please don't make me say that. Because I like to be liked by these people. And he says, if you don't say it, you and I are going to have a private talk afterwards. And I don't like God's private talks. Because it's always a one-way talk. You're laughing. You, you don't understand what it is to be in my position. And people, it's easy to criticize people like me. But you ain't never been in my shoe. That's why Moses had a lot of criticism from his people. Even his closest people. 
but they didn't understand what Moses went through God didn't tolerate anything from Moses nothing that's why he never made it to the promised land God says you knew better you shouldn't have cursed that rock you're too close to me they could curse it and I'll still take them in but not you see it's a different relationship the closer you get to God the less leverage you have write it down please some of you want to get close to God you don't know what you're talking about 37 years of trying to understand God makes me more afraid of God matter of fact the fear of God is not just being scared of God the fear of God is being aware of how dangerous it is to get close to it because getting close to God leaves you no room for maneuvering and you don't need no one to judge you when you're close to God God does it himself write this down please God detests idolatry I said this last night and I don't know if it hit home but so I read the scripture again Psalm 78 verse 58 says they angered the Lord with their high places they aroused his jealousy with their idols two things about God in this verse that normally is not associated with God what are they hatred and jealousy these two things God hates <laughs> God hates for you to hate and he hates for you to be jealous but here God is expressing that he has these two experiences in his own experience when it comes to idols tonight you'll understand why God hates idolatry and why he's jealous when someone attempts to create an idol you'll understand in a minute verse 9 of Isaiah 44 write it down it says all who make idols are nothing and the things they treasure are worthless first John 5 verse 21 says dear children keep yourselves away from idols and he's not talking about the statues that you think you know some of you think of idols and all of a sudden you think about these big statues that people are bowing down or you know these big Buddhas or something no he's talking about a car that you worship that you shine for hours but never read the Bible he's talking about those five hours of television time and no time in prayer that's what he's talking about anything that becomes more worth the than God is an idol so our battle is between the Creator and the creation that's our battle in relationship with God we have to constantly battle between keeping the priorities right the Creator is more important than the creation the Creator is more important than the creation that's a tough battle when the creation becomes more important than the Creator the result is misplaced worship let me tell you something and I'm saying this this is very very heavy but you are always worshiping hmm. the only difficulty is identifying the God you're worshiping we are always making something more valuable all the time and when it becomes more important than God you are a worshiper of whatever that thing is and that may even be as we were saying a worship conference like this it might be a song it might be a dance it might be an instrument it might be a group that you're part of it might be a dance performance or whatever it, these can become gods here's something you may want to remember the greatest temptation in human experience is the elevation of the the elevation the distraction by and the preoccupation with the creation more than the creator that's our greatest difficulty in life and I'm telling you this is not just for all of us it's for everybody we're struggling with this the value of all things are summed up in the manufacture of that thing in other words the, everything that exists gets its value from the one who made it it is as valuable as the one who produced it the value that they have in that that's what it's worth very important the source therefore is more important than the resource everybody said that aloud with me go 
the source is more important than the resource. Say it again. The source is more important than the resource. One more time. The source is more important. Now say it again, but think about God. Go. The source is more important than the resource. When the resource becomes more important than the source, you have an idol. Very important. When we acknowledge, now here's the most important point for tonight. When we acknowledge the source, then that's when we begin to worship. Worship does not begin when you start singing. I'm going to explain acknowledge in a minute. Worship does not begin when you start dancing or when you start making music on an instrument. That's not worship. True worship begins when you acknowledge the source. I've got to explain that. Everybody say worship. Okay, we're talking about worship in this conference, worshiping God again. But we haven't defined worship fully. I did some research over the years. I hope you would buy my book uh, tonight and read it. The book is entitled The Purpose and Power of Praise and Worship. I dealt with worship in that as much as I could. And it might be a good book for you to use as a reference. But I wanted to recap worship. Please write this down. And you, a pastor, open your Bible and turn to the page between Malachi and Matthew and use that blank page and write this down. Because that's... The, Worship is the center of the Bible. So put it right where it is. What does the word worship mean? First of all, it's from, the, from our concept of worth-ship. Putting worth on someone. And that's where the concept, the root word comes from. But it has a number of meanings in the Greek and the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word for worship actually means to esteem with worth. Secondly, it means to honor. Thirdly, it means to place highest value on. When you worship something, it's called, no, when you place highest value on something, it's called worship. So you can put a higher value on a TV show. You won't miss any time every week you want to watch the TV show. You cancel, you know, appointments with your pet family and your kids because you don't want to miss this show. So you've placed high value on this TV show every week. It, it has become now an idol, see? You can apply this list to anything. Look at this next word. The worship means to bow down. To bow down means to bend yourself, right? Okay. So, to worship means you bend yourself towards something. You bend yourself towards your car. Instead of going to church, you've got to clean your car today. So you bend your life toward the car, see? That's why it's called bowing, huh? You can bend yourself toward how good you sound rather than bend yourself to God, who you're singing to. So now the song has become the idol that you worship, not the God who you plan to sing to. Whatever you bend yourself to, you are worshiping. Another meaning of the word is the word to acknowledge in all things. The word worship means to acknowledge in all things. Please write this one down. This is probably the center of worship. This one is the center of it. To acknowledge in all things. And the next concept of the word worship is the word perpetual gratitude. Everybody say that with me. Perpetual gratitude. What is worship? Perpetual gratitude. What is worship? Perpetual gratitude. How long is perpetual? All the time, constantly, everywhere, every time, all the time. You wonder why David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And his praise shall continually be. Now, the only way for that to be possible is for something else to cause it. You and I are struggling with praising God every day. I won't talk about all day. We got we to gotta even find a certain day to focus on him. We got some problems. We call it, you know, worship day. Some do it on Saturday. Some do it on Sundays. The Muslims do it on Friday. You know, everybody got their little day. Because we don't do it the rest of the week. What did David discover that made him praise the Lord continually? See, that's the issue. 
The word worship also means to prostrate, to prostrate yourself, to prostrate yourself. It also means to mingle. It's a deep word. When you worship your TV, you're mingling with it, don't you? Ah, keep quiet, keep quiet. Don't stop making noise. It's a good part. Stop. So you're mingling, you're so engrossed, in, you're having an intercourse with the thing. Uh, whatever you worship, you like to do it in quietness. You know, you like to focus. Some people got secret sins that are idols. And when they're doing that sin, they don't want nobody around. Am I talking to anybody here? Private, deep intermingling. It's worship. Maybe the reality is you can't worship corporately. Maybe the reality is you can praise corporately. <laughs> when I studied worship, which I did for many years, way back in 1975, I went to Christ for the Nations to speak, and I met a man who changed my life. He's dead now. His name is Sam Sasser. Sam Sasser is the first man I heard speak on worship and praise from the Greek context and the Hebrew context. It blew my mind. And from that day, I decided I want to learn about God. I want to learn to worship God like that. And I studied and studied. I read all of his books. I listened to his tapes over and over again. I went back to college. I even took a course in Hebrew. I wanted to learn. And the more I learned about worship, the more I realized we don't know worship. We don't know worship. Friends, and here's what I understand about worship. Worship, the best way to describe worship is like this. When my wife and I are apart, distance like this, she's sitting there, right? If I say, honey, you are beautiful, you are lovely, you are glorious, you are kind, you are wonderful. Now, what am I doing to her? Praising her. See, I'm far away. So praise is a sign that you ain't close yet. And the louder your praise is, is proof that you're still farther away than you think. That's why I say much of what we call worship ain't worship. Now, when my wife and I, you know, when I finish talking to my wife, all that deep stuff, that's praise. When we enter the inner chamber of our home, which is our bedroom, there ain't much loud noise in there no more. And when we engage in interchange of sexual intercourse, there is no need for any talk at all. It means to surrender yourself to the person. I love you, Lord. God said, I hear you. See, you're still far away. When you get into real surrender, that's why the highest level of praise, you find in my book, please read the book again, is the word tehillah in Hebrew. And it actually means spirit song. Now, tehillah is not a song you sing to him. The healer is the song that he begins to sing with you. It's a spirit song. Barak is always right before the healer in the ascending praise. I'm not teaching levels of praise tonight, but there are seven levels, and the sixth level is Barach, B A R A C H in Hebrew. And it means to be quiet. To halal is noise. Halal means to jump around wildly and make noise. Shabbat means to shout. All those are lower levels. The higher you get, the quieter it gets because you're going into the chamber. And Barak is the last one before the song, Tehillah. And it means to be quiet. That means he's about to make love. He don't want no talk. Oh, I'm getting too deep now. Barak is, you ever heard this? <laughs> David says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Now, in other words, all the, all the activity before that point was noisy and loud, trying to get him there. When he arrives, it says, now shut up. Come on. Let the earth what? 
keep silent. See, when he show up, he come for intimacy. When we have a loud musical and worship experience, we think we had a big time. Do you know why most of you left here quiet last night? Maybe it was an inner court message. It was a chamber reminder. And you can't quite go out dancing if there's a chamber experience. You go out pregnant. Oh, you'll get it some other day. You can never get pregnant with God's presence in the outer courts. You flirt with God out there. Praise describes God. Worship is a surrender to God. Intimacy. Here's the biggest one to write down, please. To worship is the Hebrew word, which means to ascribe credit of all things to. To ascribe credit for all things to. What does it mean to worship? To ascribe credit of all things to. Now, please spell the word correctly. Some of you don't misspell the word. The word is what? Ascribe. It is not describe. Describe is praise. Ascribe is worship. When you describe someone, you talk about them. When you ascribe, you always got to use the word to afterwards. I just said something so deep, you got to hear it again. When you use the word describe, you cannot use the word to afterwards. But when you use the word ascribe, you have to use the word to. And that's where worship begins. Worship begins when you finally figure out everything is his. I feel so lonely. Oh God, just let me go drive a taxi and settle down and be nice and make money. Go to church and pay a tithe. Be so much nicer. Hallelujah. Everybody say ascribe. Ascribe is the key to understanding worship. Because when you ascribe to someone, you are giving them credit. <laughs> when you describe someone, you are telling them how they look or how they are. Great is the Lord. That's not worship. That's description. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. That ain't worship. That's description. The Lord is powerful. That's not worship yet. That's description. Thou art awesome. Thou art worthy. No, no, no. That is still praise. You're describing it. Write this down, please. Praise is what we do. But worship is what God receives and allows and accepts. <laughs> Oh, listen to me. If you get this, you'll understand humility. Let me tell you what God hates the most. I mean, read it tonight. God hates idols. Okay, you're going to see why in this verse, in this statement. You see, <laughs> anyone who you ascribe anything on earth to and they receive it allow it and accept it they are competing with God they're in danger immediately hope you hear me hope you hear me if someone says you sing well you better be careful how you respond 
I mean, think from this night, because you put yourself in danger. Let me tell you, you see Nebuchadnezzar, you study Nebuchadnezzar's problem. God made Nebuchadnezzar king. God told him, bless your kingdom. But Nebi began, you know Nebi? Nebi began to think it was him. You know, God was fine with him until he started thinking. I am God. Now God says, now you see, I was being so nice with you. Let me tell you something. Follow me carefully. Please listen to me. It's okay for people to praise you. But don't receive it. Don't accept it. Keep passing it on. That is called worship. You are ascribing your success to someone else. If you study Jesus, who was the most perfect human that ever lived on earth, what made him so distinctive, Pastor, was this, these statements. I can only do what I see my father do. I only speak the words I hear my father say. I only can do the works that my father does. He kept on transferring the credit to God. And that protected him and kept him in power. The power flow is tied to credit transfer. The danger of success is you receiving the credit and allowing others to give it to you and accepting it as if you deserve it. You are now in trouble with God because now the people are worshiping you. Now, don't get me wrong. You should, Jesus praised a lot of people. He praised the centurion. I've never seen such great, I mean, he praised, you know, the rich young ruler. He says, oh, the Bible says, oh, how he loved him. I mean, he praised a lot of people. But you keep transferring it. You know what made David successful with Goliath? These words. You come to me with a sword and a shield and a spear. But I come to you not in my expertise with a sling. See, you could be a good singer, an expert on the piano, an expert with choirs, but you better be careful when you start talking. I don't come to you with a sling. He never said I come to you with a sling, you know. He said, you come to me with your spear and your shield and your sword. I come to you, this normally say, with my sling, and I'm good at it. You get yourself in trouble with God. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Israel. God says, no, that's what I want to hear, son. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix this sling good. Write this down, please. Worship is only possible through the knowledge of the one being worshipped. You cannot worship beyond what you know about the person. Your worship is limited to your knowledge of the person. I believe that's why we end up worshiping things. Because we know our talent real good. But we don't know the God who gave it to us real good. So we worship what we know. You cannot worship what you don't know. So whatever you know, you worship. Say la. Let me go back to a point I made last night. Here's the point. 
the reason why God keeps making you go through experiences is so that you could have material to worship him with I feel lonely up here I feel lonely God will not bring you out of the fire because he wants you to know he's a fire surviving God so that when you come out of the fire you got something to say that's new about him again that's worship you ascribe to him my God is inflammable how did you know that I've been through the fire see he allows you to go through the difficulty to introduce himself to you in a new way again and every area he takes you to, it's a new introduction of God so now you see if you ain't had no experience with God you would you, you can't worship him people say you don't know what I've been through so you don't know why I'm singing or dancing that's that's important when God began to talk to the children of Israel, he always brought up their past. You read it? Every time he'd rebuke them, he'd say, don't you remember what I did? I bought you out of Egypt. I provided food for you. I fed you in the desert. I gave you clothes. I gave you water, the war rock. I gave you food from the heaven. He said, in other words, he began to say, look, you got enough material to keep ascribing the credit to me. Lord, have mercy. There's a scripture in the Bible that you should not even be singing. The scripture goes like this sing to the Lord a new song that is not a song that is a command the way you got what they call the song for the Lord is from experience so if you had no experience with God you couldn't sing to the Lord a new song so he kept singing old song so you can tell where people are at by the songs they're singing feel lonely so if you're singing 16th century songs which are great songs don't get me wrong but if that's all the songs you're singing <laughs> that's the only experience you had hallelujah and some of you ain't got no song lately that's what David was saying. David says, sing the Lord a new song. Go get some new experiences. Go through some more hell. Now that's an interesting request. Lord, I need some new songs. God said, okay, let's go. And he takes you through the valley, through the flood, through the blood, through the mass. He says, now, what do you think about that? He said, Lord, I got a new song. Some through the water, some through the flood. So you ain't never been through a flood, so you're singing someone else's song. Everybody say, sing your own song. Tell your neighbor, find your own song. Tell your neighbor, you have your own song. That's why you're supposed to sing in the Holy Spirit, you know. You're supposed to sing to him based on what you just came out of. You don't need no worship leaders to get no meeting started. Oh, I don't want to get into that too quick. Worship is only possible based on the knowledge of the one you're worshiping. You cannot call great God if he had never shown his greatness to you. So it's not worship, it's called repetition. You know, people don't know what I've been through. They don't know me. And people talk about me, criticize me. They don't know me. I didn't appear in a day. When I wrote the song, Brand New World, I was experiencing some things. And everybody sings the song now. But that, that ain't their song. It's my song. And I didn't write that to have a nice song. I was in a development phase of my life where I began to realize that the world ain't got no help except Jesus. So I wrote that experience down. And people sing it. It's my song. We sing David's song, you know, we ain't never kill no lad, no giant. <laughs> you remember how Moses got his first song? 
Read it in the book of Exodus. His first song was written, when the, when the water came together, splash behind them. And Moses looked. It says, Moses began to sing, and his sister picked up a tambourine, and Moses did not, you know, he didn't say, I can sing a hit. I can write a hit. Moses wrote what he just experienced. He says, the Lord my God is my strength and my song. For he has dashed the enemy. He has drowned Pharaoh and his army. And he was a song of an experience. What are you singing about lately? The reason why God would allow your mortgage payment to go right to the end. I mean right to the end. Because he wants you to sing about him as the mortgage payer. See, if you keep finding your own way of paying it, you ain't got no song. You know, in this ministry, we go through our phases of tribulation and trials as far as believing God for what we're doing in the vision. And I am aware, and you see, my problem is I don't panic because I'm aware of what God is like. And because you're having a tough time doesn't mean God ain't with you. Don't misunderstand this. God, <laughs> God allows you to go in the lion's den. Why? He wants a lion song. He wants you to see him as the owner of lions. Can I hear an amen? No one before Daniel had ever, ever heard of a man sleeping in a den with hungry lions. Which means there must have been a power in the den that was greater than the lions that the lions respected. Daniel came out knowing something about God that no one else ever knew. He's a lion taming God. Lift your hand, thank God he's going to tame your lions. Whatever you are sleeping with, he's going to tame. Thank him. See, you can worship now. Just find your lions, the one that, that they say going to kill you. Now you can sing about it, see? You have to become your own song. You ever been close to death? That's a lion's den. I remember when my car turned over when I was going home one night. I mean the car spinned over three times. Landed upside down. I walked out, dusted off. I wrote a song. <laughs> when I wrote a song. This is why God keeps reintroducing himself to you in new ways. He's giving you material to ascribe to him. Let's define worship in practical terms. Write this down. Worship is only reserved for the Lord. Say that with me. Worship is only reserved for the Lord. You know, my sister, listen to me. This is heavy. Write that down, everybody, please. That is the key to worship. He is Lord. The word Lord means owner, but it means legitimate owner, the one who legally owns it. That's the word Lord. You see, those of you who rent from somebody, the one you're renting from is called what? The land Lord. See, the word Lord means owner. Very important word. When you see that word in the Bible, it means mighty controller. <laughs> Why? He's mighty because he owns, and because he owns, he controls. That's why we call him Lord Almighty. He owns everything so he can control everything. It's important. Write this down. Worship is the acknowledgement and the ascribing of all things to the source. The Lord owns everything. Why? Because he is the legitimate source of everything. Why? Because he created everything. Write this down. Worship is a result of revelation of the source of creation. Oh God, have mercy, help me. I feel lonely again. Listen, please. Read that statement five times. Because until you get this, worship is a struggle.
Worship is a result. Everybody say result. True worship doesn't have to be generated. <laughs> True worship is a result of something. It's a result of a revelation that you have about who is the source of everything created. When that gets to you, when you understand it, then his praise is continually upon your lips. Oh, help me, Lord. Have you praised God for the lipstick on your lip? You don't. That lipstick came from bone, ground up bone from an animal that God made, and they mix it with coloring. Ha 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 Gotcha. Which means the lip and the lipstick belong to the owner. If you don't find God for the lipstick, then you are not ascribing to him ownership of that lipstick. Therefore, you are lacking gratitude. Yes. So everybody, service begins. Let's stand. Now let's sing. Come on, y'all sing louder. Y'all sing. Y'all ain't singing. You see, the problem is... They don't like God. They don't have an awareness. There's no revelation that the, the knee that they're standing on and the cartilage between the bone and the knee and the fact that the muscle is holding the cartilage and the knee up belongs to him. How dare you not stand? Uh, I'm tired. I ain't standing. See, you don't understand. He'll knock your knee out from under you if you fool around. See, when you get a revelation of what? The source of everything. When you get a revelation of it, there's this consciousness of constant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can walk. Wow, thank you. I'm walking. Thank you. My knees are working. Thank you. Wow, my lips are working. My tongue is talking. Thank you. My eyes. Oh, I can see you. Thank you. I can hear what I'm saying. Thank you. See, you never, it's praise content. Understand worship. When you understand where it all comes from, you don't need no cheerleaders called worship leaders. But your problem is you don't worship God, you worship the worship leaders. And they worship their song that makes you sing. And God says, I'm not in this. Write this one down, please. Worship is a natural response to an understanding of the source of all things. The largest book in the Bible is a praise book written by a politician who was the greatest king of the nation of Israel. How can this man, how can this man who is a politician write the largest praise and worship book in the Bible? Because it's simple. He used to hang out in the hills. Oh, I wish I had more time to talk to you but Dave. Dave was hanging in the hill and David realized that the mountains and the hills belonged to him. And the bush that he found for the sheep belonged to him. And the sheep that he had belonged to him and the sheep wool that the sheep had that made his clothes came from God and he understood that the piece of wood he carved his heart out of came from God he understood that the twine he made from the sheep's skin came from God he understood that the tongue he used to sing that song the Lord is my shepherd came from God so David kept on writing his gratitude we call them psalms. And here comes a lion. And David says, I got a new song today, lion. 
This lion is bringing me a new song. Who's your lion? This bear has come to take my sheep. No, he came to give me a new song. And then the big day came with Goliath. And David says, I'm going to write about you. I'm going to write about the God who took your head off. What you're going through ain't nothing but a song. Clap if you get that revelation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come here. Praise God. Get up, son. Quick. Lift your hand up. Praise God. I just felt a breeze pass me. In the name of Jesus. Shamukasa. <laughs> Go ahead. It's okay. God's going to give you a song out of what you're going through that no one knows you're brought to this place. What you came out to come here, they don't understand. But it's a song. You sit and write your own song. I'll tell you something. You cannot worship beyond what you know about God. Otherwise, you're using other people's material. That's why it's important for you to read the Bible for yourself. We run out of things to say to God because we don't know nothing else. Write this down, please. Worship is total transfer of credit to the supreme source and the owner of all things. It's worship. Worship is bowing down to him and saying, it's all yours, including me. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why you prostrate. You, you prostrate as a sign that I am yours too. See, when you lay down before a king, you tell the king, my body, everything. As long as you're standing before a king, the king says, you, you don't belong to me. You are standing on your own strength. When you lay before sovereignty, you are acknowledging that everything you are and have and is is because of him and we call it worship there's a term I didn't talk about earlier uh, when I you know when I studied come here come here again Jesus Lord of mercy it's heavy on me come here quick quick hold your hand hug me hug me hug me Felt that? Jesus, Lord, have mercy. It's like electricity. Kanamushambre Sata. Sing. Listen. God is the supreme owner of everything. There is a, a definition I gave you earlier, but I didn't mention it. What was it? To blow a kiss. You see that? Go in your dictionary, Hebrew, look up the word worship, and you'll see that there, to blow a kiss. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us. You know, we do it sometime in the West. We go, <laughs> but in the, in the culture of the East, you don't blow a kiss to just anybody. We do it to one another. You only blow a kiss to somebody you totally depend on. <laughs> to worship means to look up and go you wonderful thing you and you do it all day it means I totally depend on you you 
You know, God is not making the angels bow. Read the Bible. The angels bow because they have a revelation of who that is sitting on that throne. They know in him they live and move and have their very being. How about you tonight? I say, how about you tonight? Can you blow him a kiss? I dare you. Go ahead, blow him a kiss. See, you ain't never done that before in a worship service. And that's exactly what worship means. First thing in the morning when you wake up, you should just go. While you're still on your bed, eyes just open. He takes it. Because it means you are giving him thanks that you survived the night by his grace. I worship the Lord. I can see we're not going to make this, so we have to finish this Sunday morning. And those of you visiting by the church, you can take one break, one day from your church. Come, okay? This is so important. It'll be worth one day from your church. You take this back to your church, you see? Why worship the Lord? Ask the question. Everybody ask it. Why worship the Lord? You know, whenever you see the word worship, it's usually followed by the word Lord. Matter of fact, the words of Jesus are going to make sense in a minute. Now, we're close on the words of Jesus. Very powerful words. But let's, let's understand this. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's. What does the word Lord mean? Owner. So take the word Lord, I'll put the meaning in. Go. The earth is the owner's. See, it makes a big difference all of a sudden. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness, everything in it, and the world and all they that dwell in it, for he founded it. He is his property upon the seas, and he established it, the land, out of the waters. It's all the owners. He owns it. This is deep now. This is deep. This is deep. Not only does he own the world and the land, but all that is in it. That's you, your cat, your dog, your house, your CD player. He said, look, everything you got, don't you dare tell me it ain't from me, he says. That's why you blow kisses. That is why you lay down on your face and you prostrate. Because the minute you think you are too much to bow, you are too much to lay down, he start taking back his material. Oh, help me, Jesus. You come to worship service, nobody wants to really sing a real song. We look around, you know, in my series on worship and prayer. Please get that series, the tapes. I talk about the three, the four kinds of people in every service. You got Mrs. Watcher, the one who watches everything. Yeah? You got Mrs. Fixer. Always fixing himself, fixing himself, just fixing. They ain't no worshiping, just fixing. They singing, praise the Lord, I love you, Lord. Amen, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Fix it. Then you got Mr. Stoiber, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Coming in late, you see, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. How can you get in God's presence? All that racket, all that distraction. So he never shows up. If you came late to the meeting, you should never complain that the presence of God wasn't there. Because you caused it. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I'm trying to focus on God and I got to move on the side to let you by. And while you're late, you was fixing your hair. That means your hair was more worthy than God. So now your hair has become an idol before God, and you think it ain't funny. Worshiping God again is a dangerous thing. Write this down Exodus 23, verse 24, verse 25, rather. It says, Worship the Lord your God. Worship who? The Lord your God. Worship the owner who is your sustainer. 
The word God means self-sustaining one. Worship the owner who sustains everything. That's what you worship. What is worship? Bow down, prostrate, bend to, blow kisses at, prostrate before. Why? Surrender to him. Why? Because everything I am, have, ever will get belongs to you. And the more you prostrate, the more he gives you. Because when you give gratitude, you increase your latitude, which improves your altitude. When you get close to God, he starts giving you stuff. The last part says, watch this. Worship the Lord, out loud together, your God, and his, come on, read it, and his blessings will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. What's the key? Worship the Lord. Worship, worship ascribing and acknowledging that he owns everything. He said, you keep doing that, I'll fix you up. He ought to praise him right here. I say you ought to clap. If you can clap with everybody, clap. Clap your hands who? All ye people. And then do what? Shout to who? The Lord. Who's the Lord? The owner. Go back to worshiping God again. Don't worship your music and your songs and your worship service and your cars and your hairstyle because none of them could do what that list has on it. He will take sickness. You realize you don't need any my friend Benny to pray for you to get healed. That verse tells you how to get healed. But you see, you want Benny Hinn because you don't want to do that. You want a shortcut. You want a gift. You don't want gratitude. Why does it take sickness to make you finally turn TV off? Get friends out of the room. Shut the telephone off. And sit there with your body wrecked with disease. And you finally say, Lord. See, that's the, that's the magic word. Lord, if you don't deliver me from this bed. See, he finally got what he wanted from you. If you don't deliver me from this bed, you say, this is worship. See, that's worship. Worshiping, you know, singing around, dancing, church. Worship is surrender. Oh, God, if you don't bring me out, I can't get out of this one. That's worship. Don't wait till you have to do it to do it. Bless the Lord at all times. And let his praise be continually in your mouth. I'll take sickness from among you. You'll live long. Imagine long life is tied to gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. People talk to me often. Some of you hear me say this all the time. They think I'm kidding. When I understood this thing, this is my favorite statement for years. My wife hear me say this all the time. People who around me always hear me say this. To him be the glory. I would say, you know why? I'm aware. If I get blessed with something, that doesn't mean anything to me. To him be the glory. To him be the glory. Say it. To him be the glory. If you keep that in your mouth, you'll keep getting blessed. Keep transferring the credit. To him be glory. To him be glory. Got a new house? To him be glory. Got a new dress? To him be glory. Got a job? To him be glory. Got healed? To him be glory. Just missed an accident? To him be glory. Kids got college? To him be glory. 
No lump in the breast anymore? To him be glory. Breathing, got oxygen? To him be glory. Then everything that uses his air, he says, give me thanks. Gratitude. What do we use to worship? I'm trying to get to this verse from Jesus. Okay, write this down, please. This is amazing. What do you use for material to worship? What do you bring to worship? Now, uh, 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 oh, God have mercy. Listen, in the book of Exodus, it's amazing. Write these statements down. Worship must be as a result of whatever he asks for, including yourself. Worship, what do you bring to worship God? Well, the answer is the creator has the right to ask for anything he wants in worship. Why? 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 Because he owns everything. Oh, I'm getting a little lonely. Let me go back up here. Praise God. Do you know why he said you to dance? That's his body. You know why he tell you to jump? That's his jump. You know why he tells you to scream and shabbat? That's his tonsils. And his tongue. He owns it. He said, make noise. And you got to make noise. Why? The noise is his and the tongue that makes the noise is his. And the lip that formed the tongue to make the noise is his. So he said, I want noise right now. I feel like having noise. So he said, shabbat. Are you getting it? They said, dance. Why? The leg and the dance. And the energy to make the leg dance. Are all mine. I want to dance. <laughs> Watch this verse. This is a deep verse. God said, Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And God told him why. He says, so that they may come out to the desert to do what? Worship me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. This is deep. But the Moxie, listen, this is heavy. Pharaoh said, listen to Pharaoh now. Pharaoh said, Okay, you may go. See, he had enough trouble, right? He said, you may go. Watch him now. He says, but leave the children. Oh, I feel lonely. Moses said, no, we can't leave the children. So Pharaoh said, okay, you go take the children. Leave the cattle. <laughs> Moses went to the Lord. Moses came back. Moses said, No, we got to carry the cattle. So let's read this verse out loud. Go. But Moses said, You must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the owner, our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. He can tell us why now. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we won't know what he wants us to use to worship him. You never saw that verse in the Bible. <laughs> God said, bring all your money before you leave home and you come to the service. Well, I might ask for all. How's that for a blessing? Let me tell you something. You know what worship is? When God tells you to go in your closet and get them five suits that you love the best and give them to that man over there. Why? They are not yours. They are the Lord's. If he tells you, take them over there. Oh, you don't understand. There's some clothes that you like. Oh, I'm talking now. See, you think worship is the singing stuff you're doing? Mm -mm. Worship is surrender to the lordship, the ownership of everything. When you tell God, Lord, have thine own way. Dangerous prayer. You're giving him back his stuff. And he might ask you to give it all away. Ladies and gentlemen, you will finally understand, finally today, you'll understand the statement about this young rich ruler who came to Jesus. You finally understand it. The guy had plenty money. 
So he came to Jesus. He said, good master. Christ says, you don't know who good is, so you know, don't talk about that. He said, okay. He says, what must I do to please God? What is the most important thing I could do to please who? The Lord. Jesus answered, keep the commandments. The young man responded, I keep them and I have kept them from my youth. Jesus said, he lying. He didn't say it, but that's what he meant. He said, oh, then if thou would be perfect, watch him now, take everything you have, you have. <laughs> He's trying to get worship from the guy. He's trying to get ownership of what He's still hanging on to. He said, take everything you have and give it to the poor. And come follow me. And the scripture says, and he was very rich. And he was sad. In other words, he never worshipped. He kept ownership God says I want everybody to lay on the ground tonight with your body your first thought in this dress this is a $300 dress see and you just you lost God you lost him he, he, that's it he, he, you lost and you think this is funny we do it all the time say let's kneel kneel what my knee hurt me and blah, 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 blah. See, that's why you still got hurting knee. Because your healing was on the floor. He said what? If you worship me, I will heal you. I don't want to bend my shoes. I don't want to bend my shoes. I want to bend. God said, bend your shoes. The cow that the shoe came from is my cow. And the same blessing that gave you the shoe in the first place, I can give you ten pairs. So get yourself on the ground. Worship. We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping the dress, the shoe. It becomes more worthy. It has more worth than God. So God says, lay down. Why? I want your body tonight. No, God, you can have my hands, praise the Lord. You can have my lips. He said, I want your whole body tonight. Lay down. You could have me standing. I could even do a little hop phrase there, love. I want your whole body tonight. I own it. I tell you what I want. When you get here, I'll tell you what I want. Ladies and gentlemen, suppose Sunday morning God said, tell you all what, don't want none of that stuff you've been doing. Today I want to move all the chairs and everybody lay down. What would you? After dressing up for three hours at home, putting on your makeup, your pantyhose, and your fine Calvin Klein, he says, lay down. You don't understand worship. Could you imagine kings with crowns taking off their crowns and laying them at now that's surrender all your authority is off your head and you put it at his feet it's worship suppose God now, you, know, you could think whatever you want to about this statement but this is not a gimmick or anything suppose God decides take another offering after this teaching what would you give but they already took an offering. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, Holy Ghost can't even deal with it. Listen, the offering you gave was his, and the offering you're still keeping is his, and the job that you got the offering from is his, and the car that took you to the job is his, and the gas in the car is his. What day you tell him, tell him, him, you won't give again. So he takes it all from you, destroys everything. You start over when you ride a jitney. And you're wondering, why God? God said, because uh, 
you kept ownership we come to worship write this down ready to give what all Sunday morning should be the most wonderful experience in your church after this teaching you should not go into that meeting any preconceived ideas or what the way you expect it to be because he can ask for anything he can ask for anything Psalm 29 verse 2 says ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name worship the Lord the owner in the splendor of his holiness Psalm 95 verse 5 says 6 rather says come let us what bow down in worship let us what kneel before the owner of all things our maker who made us verse 7 for he is our sustainer God we are the people of his pasture and we are the sheep under his care so bow down he says we worship because we know from whom everything comes that's why we worship that's why I say worship is a response of a revelation see that ugly face I put up there that's the devil that ain't the last face I want you to see okay the opposite of worship here's what it is number one the opposite of worship is lack of gratitude see you thought it was the devil it isn't the opposite of worship is what lack of gratitude when you stop being thankful to the sustainer and the creator of all things you are opposing worship What's the opposite of worship? The opposite of worship is self-praise. When you start taking the credit for everything that you're doing, you are self-worshipping. Number three, the opposite of worship is self-credit. You are telling the world that it is you who brought you thus far. You ever heard this? I am a self-made millionaire. I'm a self-made woman. I'm a, what are you talking? You're about to die. You're about to be like Nebuchadnezzar. You're about to be with long fingernails, eating grass with hair all over your body in the bush. Yeah. God made a king into an animal when the king said it was he who made himself great. God made him a beast. It's incredible when you start becoming self-centered. Number four, the opposite of worship is selfish pride. The opposite of worship is what Lucifer felt from. What made Lucifer fall? Very simple problem. Lucifer wanted self-worship. He got fired. His job was to make sure everybody worshipped God. That was his job. He was in charge of the, of the music department, the worship department. He was in charge of what these people are here for, who you guys... See, you got to watch your job. Because when you start wanting the attention on you rather than the one you're trying to get us to worship, you're about to lose your job. Pride come at when? Just before a fall. And what is pride? Self-centeredness. This is about me. It's about me. It's about me. Well, I practice all week. And pastor tell me I cannot sing today. Angry for three months. You are worse than Lucifer. At least he's only angry for a blink. He fell. <laughs> but people get all uptight. I practice our dance. We worked hard. And they talk about they ain't got no time for us to dance. This ain't about you. Remember, he can ask for whatever he want, remember? And he mightn't want your dance today. What he wants is your good attitude today. And it all belonged to him, the attitude and the dance. He said he could ask for everyone. David, I mean, Job, Moses says, we got to take everything because we don't know which one he's going to ask for. I sat there one night and the Lord spoke to me to give an offering. And Richard Roberts was here. And I rebuked God a couple of times. I said, God, you got to be kidding he said, write it, give it. And he reminded me, he said, everything you have is mine. So give me what I ask for. And I was having my little easy little battle. It was over in seconds. I wrote that thing. 
It's gone. And that obedience opened a door I cannot describe. Some of us are being held up by our lack of worship. God will be telling you right now to give a, a, a cake to someone or bake, you know, some, for someone. You keep ignoring it. He told you to go home and, you know, give this sofa to someone. This is my favorite chair. God said, give that chair away. Why? He's trying to not get you a new chair. He won't give you a whole new house, but the chair holding up another house. Why? You still holding on to the chair. You think it's yours. You're not worshiping. Job, what a man. Job chapter 1 verse 20. Out loud please. And at this, come on read out loud. And this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And then he fell to the ground and worship. And he said, out loud, naked came I from my mother's womb. And naked I will depart. The Lord, come on, say it now. The owner gave and the owner took. Come on, understand it now. Bless it. Now you understanding why Job got seven times back. You finally understand the verse. You can study this verse. It was total worship. Job said, look, the wife is his. The children is his. The cow, the goat, and the barns are his. So whatever God allowed to be taken is God own. Anyhow, if he took it, he took it. If he give it back, he give it back. Whatever he want to do, bless it be. Say it out loud. Bless it. Say it in the middle of your problem. Say it loud. Bless it be the name of the Lord. See, when you say that in the middle of the situation, You're telling him you own the situation. That's worship. You don't praise the Lord when things go good. Because even the bad things belong to God. Out loud, verse 22. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Underline that verse in your Bible. We can tell them, God, you did this. And God, God said, this ain't worship. This is a curse you're putting on me. You are cursing me. You're telling me that some things I don't own. Oh, I worship. Job understood all things came from God. And he realized he was sustained by God. The minute Job did this, what happened? God turned to captivity. God is taking you through and allow you to go through what you are going through to see if you could sing in the middle of it. He's testing his lordship over your life. Worship is acknowledging total dependency on God. God, everything is yours. This is the last verse I'll give you. I want to get to Jesus. I try I want to get to Jesus before I go. I know we're over time a little bit, but please allow me. Do you mind? Just this one verse, okay? I want you to see this verse, all right? Jesus understood worship. Matthew chapter 4, a verse that you probably will finally understand now. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain. And the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he showed him their wealth and splendor. Watch the devil now. And the devil says, all of this I will give to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get in trouble here now. Satan says, I'm going to give, he's talking to God. He said, God, I'm going to give you everything you own. Come on now, let's talk about this. He says, I'm going <laughs> to... He says, I'm going <laughs> to... It's so funny, you got to laugh at the devil. Eh? He says, God, I'm going to give you everything you made. If you bow down and do what? Give me the credit. 
Oh, you don't understand. He was telling God to tell him that he made everything. Listen to the words of Jesus out loud together. And Jesus, come on, say it loud. It's important to say it loud. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the owner. Stop right there. Don't go too fast. He said, Look, it didn't say worship the thief. Oh, you missed it. You stole this from my kids. <laughs> How can you give me what is mine? Now you see the meaning. He says you only give credit to the owner who is God and him only do you surrender to. Is your boss your God? Is your job, is your dependency on your job? You know, if God sent you somewhere to work, you have to be careful. Because he owns everything. If God gave you a, 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 a car, and he says, pick up ten people to take him to church, you better go find them. That's his car, gasoline, engine, and spark plugs. Amen. And the people are his. He told you to pick up. And we wonder why we back to Jitney. Because you didn't worship God with his car. This is serious. This, this ain't no sermon. You got to understand. Jesus said, look, away from me, Satan. You can't take credit for what belongs to me and you can't tell me to give you the credit Lord the devil is a fool he's trying to tell God to tell him you made it all he's like you crazy all things work together for good so don't ever give the devil credit even for those things that ain't quite comfortable what did Job say? Naked I came. That means whatever I got on, he gave to me. Whatever I living in, he gave to me. Whatever carriage I'm driving or flying, he gave it to me. Whatever's in my belly, he gave it to me. Whatever he got in my bedroom, he gave it to me. I came here naked. <laughs> this ain't funny. He said, look, and if he take it, it's his. If he give it, it's his. God says, I'm going to turn this man's situation around now. Lift your hands and do that for five seconds. Just tell him. No, don't clap. Just tell him. Everything is from you. Everything I have is yours. Take back your house, oh Lord. Come on, give him back the house. Give him the apartment you live in. Give him the gasoline and the car in the parking lot. Give it back to him. Give him the iron ore in the car, steel that makes the car. Give him back the spark plugs that came from the oil products in the earth. Give him back the leather seats in the car. Give him back the cupboards in your kitchen and the dishes and the food in the fridge. Can you give it back to him? You are the Lord of my refrigerator, the Lord of my bedroom, my pillars. You are the Lord of my bathroom and the utensils, the kitchen. You can he be Lord again? See, that's worship. You don't need a one to make you worship. Just get a revelation of him being the source. And you can't help but lift your hands and begin to thank him just a little bit. You cannot offer God what's already his. Write this last one down. Only the owner deserves worship Jesus said him only shall thou serve when anyone wants to compete with God in your life they are asking to become an idol impossible
Can you read this out loud for me, please? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come here, lady. Come here, quick, 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 yeah. Run. I'll close him right now. This is the last one. Just hold your hand up, eh? Just hold your hand up. I'm going to hug you, eh? Ah. Now listen to me. Read it for me out loud. Everybody read. Go. And he told them this parable. What's the parable? Read it. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, keep reading. This is what I will do. I know what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, watch the mice, and build bigger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods, and I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But the Lord God said to him the owner said to him Ooh, listen to the owner talk go you fool this very night your life will be demanded from you then who will get what you have prepared for yourself this is how it will be with anyone says the lord who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward the owner i rest my case close your bibles think about a few things to thank him for How about a little gratitude before we start our car engines? My car, my house, my business, my clothes, my education, my children, my home, my refrigerator, my investments, my... He says, what are you talking about? And he says, you are a fool. God was not against this young man's wealth. Read it carefully. He was against this spirit of mine. He didn't worship. May God have mercy on our souls. Father, thank you for a good night this is a good night it's a good night forgive us can you go ahead and just confess come on pastors forgive ask God to forgive you for owning stuff mothers give your children back to him that's why the kids messing up you own them Give him back to him. Young man, give him your job back. Give him back your body. You got no right to put stuff in that that he don't allow. Because it ain't your body no more. Give him back the body. Can you thank him? You have permission to stand if you wish, to kneel if you wish, to come to the altar if you wish. Tomorrow is Saturday and you ain't got too much to rush out to do, but at least spend a few minutes before Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah. The altars are open. Maybe you want to come and kneel. Maybe for the first time for a long time you want to just dump it on him and say, I can't carry this anyhow. Take back. Even the problems belong to you. 
Lord, this body is tired, wrecked, and all kind of arthritis. Take your body back, fix it if you wish, but here's your body. Maybe that's what you need to do. I gotta go. I gotta rush. I gotta go. Listen, whatever you rush into belongs to him.